Let's do a bit of a round robin here. Um, current state of venture funding. There's right now. There's you know talk about the downturn. There's the talk about you know the downturn in tech stocks. The uh, uh, you know what's let's 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 kick off with that. Um, what do you what do you what do you think first of all? Funding climate in 2022. Well, first of all, 2022 is not one year. It's three years in one yeah. because a lot has changed in January until today. First quarter, it was crazy. It was just like last year. Uh, exuberance, a go-go, very high number of volumes in terms of dollars and deals. So it was an extension of 2021 into first quarter. Second quarter is when things started to be bad. We've seen the number of deals drop, the numbers of dollars drop 30, 40 percent. Just yeah. fewer deals, less dollars flowing. And the third quarter is even less. And it's not just the number of deals, but the rounds are getting smaller. So raising funding this year is very hard. But it's not because it's a tough year. It's because last year was crazy. If you compare this year to 2020, it's actually not bad. The problem right. is that a lot of funding that should have happened this year happened last year. Right. Funders that understood that it was a very good time to raise money went out and raised money when they didn't need it. And funders that waited this year, well, they're a bit out of luck. So 20, um, you're saying 2021 was an anomaly? A, a huge anomaly. And that actually, I think, is part of the reason why we're seeing also fewer M&A and fewer acquisitions. Acquirers are struggling to reconcile the value of these companies with their last valuations. Well, let, let's not talk with, about IPOs. Um, I come, I should caveat this with something important. I caveat this by saying that we only invest in health tech. So everything I say, please apply to health tech and don't extrapolate too generally. But we've had three IPOs that were very large last year in health tech. Two of them are down 90%. The only one doing well is Doximity. And these years, for the first six months of 2022, there have been no IPO, crickets in health tech. Absolutely right. nothing. So. I think the bad news is that if you're out raising today, yeah. make sure that you have ample time to do it. Right. If you are raised last year, well, okay. you're in a good position, but watch your valuation because it's going to be very hard to support them the next time okay. you need money. Virginia, what's your view? What's your opinion? You agree yeah. or disagree? Yeah, um, I'll take a different view. So we are a growth stage fund, so we typically invest in uh, Series A and Series B. So our ticket are maybe slightly larger, 10, 30 million. Um, and we've seen uh, a shift for sure. I do agree with your points. Uh, 2021 was uh, mostly an uh, anomaly, probably. Um, I'll start with a positive note, actually, because uh, we firstly started in uh, Europe uh, in a fund like 10 years ago. And if you compare Europe uh, even three years ago with now, it's a completely different environment. Uh, you start seeing uh, repeat entrepreneurs, uh, you start seeing uh, amazing companies out there. So um, 2021 was actually an anomaly. Um, what we see in terms of round is uh, probably lower number of rounds. Uh, yes, uh, lower valuation as well. And uh, clearly companies these days uh, do know or would like to avoid to raise at a downturn or at a lower valuation uh, compared to uh, previous year. So we are seeing actually both investor and startup becoming more creative. So we are seeing company yeah. doing uh, extension. So maybe raising at the same valuation of uh, yeah. six or nine months ago. Uh, we are seeing uh, companies raising through convertibles or we are seeing investor even uh, offering uh, to invest in tranches. So I think the market, market in general yeah. is uh, adapting. Would you say it's a buyer's market though now, Sitar? As far as deployment goes, I, yeah. I think deploying in this market is fantastic. I think the vintage is... Is it good for entrepreneurs though? Yeah, I do. I think 2021 wasn't necessarily good for founders because I think now you're going to see the hangover from that, which is trying to raise at a, at a price that supports your previous valuation, which is going to be very hard to do because 2021 was an anomaly. I yeah. also think 2021 wasn't particularly good training for founders because many founders never learned how to raise. They didn't really have to like go out and, and raise and actually go through the process. They were given money, right? More than they had to actually go out and raise money. 
So I think it is actually good for founders. I think 2021 was very much an anomaly. And the last few years have been quite a good bull market. Uh, but I'm not sure we're like back in the stone ages. I think people, and particularly journalists, are acting like it's this horrible like yeah. return to like 2001. Are you saying that journalists are like overblowing I this mean, just, uh, situation? Know, they, like, like, do they like to tear what are you, people? What are you talking do about? Do they like build people up and tear them down? No, my really? Like, never, really? Never. Us? <laughs> But like I, I, I do think like they're they're re like the last few years have been all about these crazy up rounds, and now it's those same companies that are doing yeah. down rounds. But they're always down rounds. They're always uh, companies doing layoffs. They're always our, down rounds. They never make the press. Our favorite story right now is startups laying people off. That's the media story right now. Yeah, I mean it's pretty normal for startups to lay people off, right? It's Eventually. just normally they're not startups that raised a bunch of money in the previous year. That, that's all. I, I think the difference is. What about you, uh, Carlos? I mean, frankly, they've said they've said all the key points, really. So yeah. we probably we can gonna, cover you, another one. You're going to try and I okay. mean, honestly, the, the okay. Well, let, let's let's it. let's ask, let me ask you this: Has the um, uh, the sh the shift focused? You know, obviously, for the last few years, it was grow, 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 and now a lot of the slide decks that came out from VCs say, you know, uh, everyone's focusing on revenue now. Uh, you know, stop the gr take your foot off the gas and start building out the business model, build in the revenues, those kinds of messaging. Is that what's going on? It, it is. I'll, that's probably a, like a, a, a good generalization of it. Uh, but the yeah. way the way that there was a couple of flawed assumptions in some business models, you know, the winner take all sort of mentality. And th there's some truth to that. But the problem is that in order to achieve that, you have to burn a lot of money. And I think that the case study that we're, we're all familiar with are all the quick commerce type businesses, right? or any of this sort of scooter micro-mobility. They're all businesses that when at scale, you can achieve quite a bit. And so, you know, that kind of thinking permeates the entire venture community. It becomes uh, some uh, a systemic thinking, and then all of a sudden, everyone's encouraged to follow that trajectory regardless of whether it makes sense for them. And so now, I think everyone's taken, you know, a reality pill, and I think Sitar is right, in the sense that we last year made some decisions collectively uh, jointly and collectively and complicitly with, with founders on uh, enabling things that didn't really work um, at, at, in a sustainable way. And I think this year is about a, a return to that, a return to looking at what is a sustainable way of growing a company. Right. So, so sustainability is the, is the kind of messaging you're put, putting to your companies. Is that right? Well, we're trying to help our companies understand that there is less room for mistakes, perhaps, than there was before. Uh, in the funding market is less forgiving of companies that do not grow and sustainably so quarter over quarter so for us actually it's about thinking about the quality of that revenue are you hitting your market correctly are you speaking with the right customers you to speak with and are you able to convert from those customers into the broader segments that are your playground so we're putting more and more attention into making sure that Companies are not shooting blindly, 360 degrees, and selling to whoever moves, but actually making sure that the first customers mm. they hit are the ones that can sustain growth uh, sustainably, quarter over quarter. I just want to yeah. add one little detail. Un sustainable growth does not mean unambitious growth. Right. It just means using capital in an adequate and, and sustainable way so that you don't have to constantly go to a increasingly expensive capital markets to continue to grow. Exactly. Sit up. No, I, I agree with that. But you presented it as revenue versus growth, and I think part of the problem for the last few years was unsustainable revenue growth, right? Like these businesses all had revenue. I mean, they, okay, some didn't, but they, a lot of them had revenue. They were just the growth efficiency was horrible, right? The amount they were burning to get to that revenue was just unbelievable. But it's fine as long as there's more money for you to raise, right? And like, cap, like money was so cheap. Like money so was it made, so cheap it made people years. made startups more inefficient. Hugely inefficient, right. right? And you had like huge sales teams and like high CACs and, and you know, when capital is cheap, you probably should take advantage of it, right? Because you are in a race, uh, but ultimately it's a marathon, right? And so you have to be able to, to last. And I think all we're going is back to is, is again, not a lack of ambition. I don't think Europe is in any way unambitious. It's just going back to a level of growth that you can sustain. Yeah, yeah but we, we are coming from a market that at the end was uh, rewarding uh, pure growth or, you know, the growth at, at all costs. But the reality is that sometimes this was not creating a 
sustainable long-term business. So on the positive side, uh, maybe crisis or this uh, period can bring uh, clarity, so can force uh, actually the startup to start asking themselves about, okay, how do I reach a product market fit? Um, how do I achieve my sustainability growth? And uh, uh, that's a positive side of it. Um, so we, we've gone through, I mean, we've, we've gone through some tough times. The pandemic kind of put the foot on the gas for digitization, lots of startups. You know, two years ago, there wasn't, three years ago, I'd never heard of a supply chain logistics startup. Now there's billions of them, you know. Um, so it created whole new categories. We just saw uh, Sachin Dev Dugar from Builder. You know, now your common, you know, you know your corner store wants a, a delivery style app. Uh, so there's been enormous amounts of digitization, total change, remote working, the whole works. Um, and then we had 2021, uh, sorry, yeah, 2021, there was enormous kind of, you know, IPOs out, you know, uh, out coming out of our ears. But, and now with this, you know, re, kind of reset, what are we looking at that in terms of where the exits are going to come from in the next few years? Are we talking, are we, we parking this year and looking for the next year or the year, a couple of years time, or where, where are we on that? Virginia? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do think exit will shift of a few years, most likely, especially because uh, if you are facing the public market, uh, we are talking about an IPO and you can look at the number this year or in the past six months uh, is uh, not even one thirty of what happened in 2021. Um, alternative is M&A. There, uh, there is still appetite, uh, especially for uh, um, for the larger companies or IT companies, so that's a possibility. But I believe that most of the exit will probably be shifted of uh, at least a couple of years. So right. I actually had two friends exit in the last two weeks. Uh, and I think part of what's happening is there's just a lot of cash in the yeah. market, right? Companies raised a lot of money. They need to deploy it. They want ROI on that money. And you can build or you can buy. Mm. And there's a lot of good buying opportunities for scale-ups and large tech. And so I think a lot of that money will be deployed into not huge exits, but actually exits for seed and series A founders that are very good exits for them and will be, you know, okay returns for investors. And I think that's also a positive because what you're then creating is a, a, a new generation of founders that actually have exits. Their employees made money on the options and, and that's a really good thing for Europe. It's a whole new class of angel investors a whole new class of emboldened uh, venture kind of style founders that want to build their next business. Uh, so I think, I think it's a positive. And I think we will see that. We've already seen it in the last few months. They probably haven't hit the press yet. And we're going to hit, we're going to get it for the next two years. Right. And I want to add that it's good that funders have a very good macro view of what's happening. But we see a lot of differences depending on where they're playing exactly. We're just health tech. And yet, we are seeing tremendous difference from, for example, medical devices, surgical tools, very hard to raise. Uh, it was very hard already for the past couple of years because of clinical trials issues, but uh, at least surgery started to happen again, and you had a lot of activity last year in MA as well. And this year, everything seems to have stalled. On the other side, if you look at telemedicine, well, you have seen that virtual care has started to happen, and now there are habits and patterns that are becoming mainstream, Companies are raising money much more easily than in other subsectors of health technologies. Those is where we will see more acquisitions in the next years to come. So I think funders need to be smart, yes. Understand the market broadly, but don't overgeneralize because you're gonna have to play in your small playground. And that's where you can see that some sectors are very ready to make acquisitions soon. Others will just take a few years. And yeah. just have Carlos, to sit out and build. Carlos, do you agree that it'll take a few more years, the exits? Or? It, it will, but I mean, it's, I think Sitar is right. There's a lot of weird things happening right now with a lot of capital on the sides. So def define exit. You mean public? Okay, nobody's going to do an IPO anytime in the next four months, five months, for sure. But yeah. m and is happening all the time right now. It's great teams to pick up. Yeah, totally. Lots of M&A. Finally, what about um, opportunities? Like, what do you think, you know, I mentioned supply chain logistics. That was kind of quite hot for a bit. I'm not sure how hot it is. Probably resilience is new. Warehousing startups, bizarrely, are strangely hot now. What, what, other, what, what sort of trends are you seeing? New, new things that you've seen? Yeah, so for, for those of you that um, like to, to um, 
read some of the geopolitical books out there. There's a great author, his name is Peter Zeihan. I don't know if you've read his book, The End of the Just the Beginning. And I think it's really interesting if you, if you correlate that with other books that showcase kind of what's happening around the world, including a declining population in developed countries, um, the nearshoring of manufacturing, some of the challenges having to do with the logistics supply chain, and the rise of automation. All that stuff's not changing anytime soon. It's not, we're not nowhere near done solving those problems. So all we're looking at for opportunities is like, what level of that whole egg can we penetrate? Because not all of it can be penetrated. One of the issues, for example, with uh, sustainable energy is, how do you distribute equally in a grid in Europe that wasn't designed for interoperability? You know, the French and the Spanish can't agree on how to send an electricity to each other. So how can we invest in that? But that's what needs to come. That's the next five years, is figuring out how to solve these problems that are just looking at us straight in the face. Right, these um, big mega trends. Yes, and, and those, some of them are regulatory, some of them are contextual, and the context is changing. This year, massive big change that has driven people to coalesce a lot more than ever yeah. before. Sita. So a different area that I think is, has been issuing for the last couple of years and will continue to be is gaming's evolution into the next s social space. So what we're seeing is more and more companies that are treating games and gaming platforms not as gaming primarily, but primarily as a way for people to interact with each other. So you look at like Roblox and Fortnite as sort of the leaders in the space, I think there's gonna be a whole other generation. And Europe in particular is really well placed for this because it has some of the best gaming studios in the world, are in the Nordics and in, in Germany and France. And so I think a lot of the, my own view is I think the next generation of social networks are games. And so what we do in them, what we need for them, the way AI, both uh, contextual and visual, plays into them are all going to be really interesting areas. And we've already made some interesting investments in that over the last couple of years, and we're continuing to see really great companies in that space. Regina? Um, I think there are a lot of industries that, that are trying to solve problems that are here to stay. Take, you know, climate tech. Uh, it's not that the climate crisis will go away in a couple of years. So. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities uh, where companies are trying to solve a problem that is uh, here and will still be here in four or five years or in the long term. So you can take climate tech, but even if, uh, if you consider all the challenges that corporates and startup face these days, are, these are not only of financial nature. So take the human capital consideration, talent. Talent is a problem now, will be a problem in the next uh, three years. So companies are trying to understand how to retain the best talent and there are also a lot of trends in the HR tech side that are quite interesting. Um, we, we've done a survey with one of our portfolio companies a few weeks ago. We uh, surveyed two, three thousand uh, uh, workers in the tech ecosystem in Europe and we find out that 30% of the people working in tech are actually not really happy and 50% are actually trying to change their jobs in the next 12 months. So right. there are a lot of startups that are trying to focus on how to retain talent, uh, you know, from the employee benefit space uh, to uh, upskilling. So I think yeah. that's an interesting part. Great. Finally. Well, if Marta. you are investing or building in healthcare, I give you three areas of opportunity. One that is closing soon, one that is mature now, and one that is next. The first one is clinical trial enablement. The last two years I've exposed a lot of mess and there is a need for technology to improve clinical trial success rate. The second one is provider-facing solutions that have very clear ROI for hospitals that need to do more with less and adapt to the transition of value-based care. And the third one is tooling for healthcare participants. So we see companies create technologies to help other health technology companies create software, train their AI, and in general, build the platforms that then enable those companies to build new applications on right. top. So those three. Brilliant. Well, I really appreciate you guys coming and to the Europa's Awards. So big round of applause, please, for our investors. Thank you so much. <laughs>